Hi everyone and uh, welcome back. Hope you enjoyed your long break, extended break. All right, uh, let's continue uh, from where we left. So uh, when we talk about the tabernacle, in the last session we spoke about, uh, you know, if you have to start talking about the tabernacle, we start from Genesis chapter 3. And uh, 2,500 years or uh, approximately later, God has a resting place, a dwelling place uh, here on earth. And so for 2,500 years, there was no resting place for him. And uh, nobody, uh, not a single man, thought about, uh, you know, building something or asking God about his dwelling place or his resting place for 2,500 years that think about it now today we say Jesus came 2,000 years ago and think of everything that has happened 2,000 in 2,000 years and add another 500 years to it and so for that those many years um, there was no resting place for God here on earth so tabernacle as mentioned was mending a tear uh, that sin had separated us from the spirit of God uh, and, and knitting it back together, uh, like a meeting place where humanity would meet with divinity, um, right? And then we go on to see, when once we start talking about the tabernacle, we usually start talking from the outer courts, uh, the altar and the laver, but we uh, very rarely uh, talk about uh, the gate. We don't start from the gates as well, but that's where I'd like to start. Um, and I want to call this the gate as the place of introduction, a place where we uh, we meet the Savior, kind of. Thing. Okay, so Psalms 104 verse: say, "Enter His gates with thanksgiving, His courts with praise." Right, um, and uh, and we read about uh, you know when Pharisees complain to Jesus and say, "Look at these children." Uh, you know what they are singing and then Jesus quotes Psalm 8 right haven't you read or heard that from the lips of infant I have ordained praise and why am I saying that is it says that there were children inside the courts the temple gates in other words right and so courts and um, so gate was like an entrance isn't it to the outer courts but the gate was made of four colors it was the thick uh, and some say it was opened not like you know a gate would open wide like this but it had like one of these curtains that you pull it would go up uh, that's what they say uh, but again you know I, I don't know <laughs> uh, but it was made of four colors right it was made of blue purple scarlet and white right uh, white is fine linen also known as fine linen uh, we see in you know in John chapter 14 verse 6 Jesus says that I am the way the truth and the life right? and John chapter 10 verse 9 he says I am the gate and whoever enters through me will be saved he will come in and go out and find pasture right? I am the gate I am the way the truth and the life so um, why is that important this is where we are being into I'm, I'm we are calling this a place of introduction isn't it we are meeting we are encountering our Lord and Savior we are being introduced to his grace and his mercy and to who he is right um, so and again we looked at the picture of the tabernacle where on all the three sides where it was surrounded with white cloth it's about six feet or so but there was only one gate there was no gate for every side there was no east you know south gate west gate uh, you know north gate there was only one gate there was like one way right um so i am the way and that way would lead eventually to the presence to the ultimate presence of god which is the ark of the covenant uh but and so that's the place of introduction as we can call it and uh very quickly uh, we mentioned that the gate was made of four colors, isn't it? Blue, purple, scarlet, and all of each of those colors uh, signify or symbolize uh, something in the scripture, scripturally. Okay, the blue 
was always uh, is used to symbolize everything that is divine. Uh, when you read about it in Revelation and you look, read Ezekiel 126, it talks about like the sea of glass, which was like sapphire, like blue in color, right? So everything divine uh, would be symbolized with the color blue, um, right? And so that is, uh, and that, that symbolizes or that portrays Jesus as the Son of God, is the divine Son of God, right? The, um, the only Son of God the Father. And then we look at, there's the color purple, right? Purple is the color of royalty, right? Kings where their, uh, what is that? Their uh, reign of their robes, right? It would be purple in color. It's, it's the color of royalty. And so as my king, I obey him. As, as the son of God, I worship him. And scarlet, the color of blood, red, uh, right? Signifies or symbolizes the blood of Jesus. Right, who uh, cl what cleanses us and saves us, heals us, and restores us. And then fine linen is his purity, his holiness, his righteousness. Right, and so at the gate we encounter Jesus in all his four offices, so to say. Right, we encounter him as a son of God. We are introduced to him as our king. We are introduced to him as our savior. Right, we are introduced to him as a spotless lamb, as a perfect man, as a righteous son of man. And Jesus is portrayed uh, as all of this very differently in each of the gospels. So, if you read through the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus is portrayed as the king of the Jews. Right, where you see that. Get the color purple, right? And then from in the book of Luke, so you see Jesus as the friend of sinners, right? Who came to save us, who shed his blood. And then in the gospel of Mark, we see that he is a perfect son of man, righteous and sinless man. And in, in the gospel of John, we see him as the son of God, right? So all of these four gospels portray Jesus very differently, right? And uh, see, look, I'm not an artist. I am, uh, as in, I'm not a painter. I can't draw for nuts and I can't color for, yeah, uh, like the worst. <laughs> I can't imagine. Uh, but what I learned recently is uh, just like an off note kind of a thing that I want to share is uh, you see in the book of Revelation and all of heaven, they have only one reason to praise him and worship him is that he is worthy. That's the song of the heaven. They sing that he is worthy, right? Um, the lamb that was slain. He is worthy to open the scrolls, right? And worthiness and the worth was always associated with royalty. And that's why, you know, he's also worthy. Now, what I learned about colors recently is that um, if you want to buy a color pack, a paint pack, uh, you will never find the color purple in any of the boxes. So you mix the color red, white, and blue. So when you mix those three colors, you get the color purple. Um, and and so you know, as as Jesus, who came as a perfect man and a sinless man, as a son of God, and who died for us on the cross by shedding his blood, all of these three offices made him worthy to be seated on the right-hand side of the Father. And we call him as the King of kings and the Lord of lords, right? And so at the gate, it's the gate of introduction where we are introduced to um, to the full, uh, you know, he's the prophet, prophet, priest, and king, right? Jesus, as we, as we know, so he is the gate, um, you know, and he says it in John 10, 9, so I am the gate who enters through me will be saved. So we, that's a place of introduction. Uh, that's the first place you uh, uh, in the in, in the tabernacle of Moses, and then we go on. Now we go on to the outer courts, right? Um, so the outer court, as we know, is um, had two furnitures. One is the uh, brazen altar or the bronze altar, altar of sacrifice, also known, uh, and the brazen laver. Uh, the Let's call the brazen lay, uh, altar or the altar of sacrifice as a place of the reconciliation, right? It's a place of sacrifice. Uh, it's a place that symbolizes the cross where the ultimate sacrifice was done, 
right? Uh, where the sinless and the spotless lamb was sacrificed for us. Uh, are, are you with me? Right? In John chapter 1, uh, verse 29, uh, he, you know, he, he, it writes that, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, until Jesus came, what was happening on the altar and on you know, the Ark of the Covenant where the blood was poured on the mercy seat was a covering for the sin. Right? It was, uh, it was not, uh, uh, what do I say? It's, it was just a patchwork, so to speak, right? Like a temporary fix, but the ultimate fix solution for the problem was paid through Jesus, our ultimate sacrifice. Right? It, it was a place of surrender. Uh, uh, it was a place where you would lay down your will. And we learned quite a bit about the altar, isn't it, in, in previous classes. Um, where we are not encouraged to just build altars, but to be on the altar. And because of what Jesus did, now we are reconciled. Okay, this is another image of the cross that we are learning um, here. Is what was torn, what we thought was torn, uh, Jesus mended it. Uh, you know, and this was again. This is shown in the tabernacle of Moses as a temporary fix, as an altar of uh, the altar of sacrifice, also known as a place of reconciliation. Okay, um, uh, are you all with me? Right. Okay, and so. Uh, one of the things that we can learn from this thing is that we are, again we are encouraged to offer up our bodies as living sacrifice, as Paul writes in Romans chapter twelve, verse one. We looked at that verse uh, before, so I'm not going to go uh, deep into it. Uh, yeah, so the altar of burnt offering—that's the place of reconciliation. Uh, and the next uh, place that we are introduced, next thing that we are introduced is the water basin, uh, the brazen laver. For the place of sanctification, we're going okay. Um, so in Exodus chapter thirty, I'll just go through and read the scripture that's in the notes. Um, Exodus thirty, verse seventeen to twenty-one. It says, "You shall also make a laver of bronze, with its base also of bronze for washing. You shall put it between the tabernacle of meeting and the altar. Okay, you shall put put it between." the tabernacle, the inner courts, and the altar. And you shall put water in it, for Aaron and his sons shall wash their hands and their feet in water from it. When they go in the tabernacle of meeting, or when they come near the altar to minister, to burn an offering made by fire to the Lord, they shall wash with water, lest they die. So they shall wash their hands and their feet, lest they die. And it shall be a statue forever to them to him and his descendants throughout their generations. Um, now, there's a couple more scriptures you can read. Um, in Leviticus chapter 8, verse 5 and 6, they had to wash. Uh, it was a place of washing and cleansing. Um, and, uh, and, and I think there's another passage that I forget where it, was, where it talks about it. Uh, it, it mentions that uh, the, in, the inside of the laver was made up of mirrors that was used by women. I forget the reference part. Um, if anybody can find it, just share it on the chat section. Okay. So, um, why is this uh, important? It was a place of a sanctification or a purification. Right? Uh, because the priests would work with the sacrifices, their hands would be messy, you know, with say wood and be black in color, blood in their hands, their feet would be dirty uh, and whatnot. So before they would enter the inner courts or the holy place, they were commanded by God to wash their hands and their feet before they enter. It was a place of sanctification or purification. Now today, now the hands symbolizes works. It symbolizes work, work, right? But we don't work for our sanctification. We don't work for our salvation. It was given to us freely by God. 
right? He died for us. While we were yet sinners, Jesus died for us, right? So we don't attain salvation or we, uh, by working with any, of, with any of our doing, so to speak. Okay? Uh, but yet, we need sanctification and we need purification because we continue to walk this walk of life, of faith. Isn't it's an imagery, it's a metaphor, right? We continue to walk, we continue to run this race. Uh, and, uh, you know, and so we read that in Ezekiel 36, 25, it says, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your uncleanliness. And from all your idols, I will cleanse you. Right? Um, and John 1, 31, uh, if, I'm not, if I'm right, it says, uh, I think John the Baptist he says, I myself did not uh, know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. So again, the imagery, the use of water there. And uh, you remember the first miracle of Cana? Yeah, he turned water to wine. Yes. Uh, now, there were six jars that was used that was set there, isn't it? Um, and that was filled with water, the stone jars, as we call it now. Uh, now, those six, the six jars of water, huge jars of water. Those that those jars were known uh, for was kept separately for purification. The priests would use that water to again wash their hands, their feet. It was uh, a water used for purification, for cleaning. And so he, Jesus turns the water that was set apart for priests to clean into wine. Again, that which symbolizes blood. Uh, you see how he uses uh, imagery, like you know, back and forth, back and forth. Um, right. Um, and another thing that I want to mention is why, why I wanted to stress that that the internal part of it was made of a uh, women, uh, women's mirror is uh, in James chapter 1, verse 22 and 25. Can someone, uh, wait, like, let me just see. Oh, let me see if I can find it. Let's go to James chapter 1. Okay, uh, it talks about how God's word cleanses us how his word is like a mirror right uh, so James chapter 1 verse 22 onwards it says uh, but be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourself for if anyone is a hearer of the word and do not are uh, not a doer he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror for he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like uh, verse 25, but the one who looks into the perfect law, which is, you know, law means the word of God, the law of liberty, and preserves, I'm sorry, and perseveres, being no, uh, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. Uh, and so we see that the place of sanctification, the bronze labor, represents all these things. Right, uh, we we need to con uh, constantly uh, be cleansed, um, you know, and by the reading of the word, and we ask Jesus to wash us, uh, and and eventually we we read about uh, you know where Jesus uh, in chapter thirteen verse five, uh, John chap John chapter thirteen verse five, uh, where he took a basin, he filled it with water, and he started washing the feet of the disciples, not their hands. Right. That means again, what it signified that they have walked long distances and their feet is dirty, so they need to be cleaned. And so we walk this walk of life of faith uh, every day, and and we we need cleansing. We need purification. We need sanctification. Um, right. All good, right? So far, okay. So we've so we've gone through the place of introduction. 
uh, and we've gone through the place of reconciliation, which is the altar of sacrifice. And we come to the altar of sanctification, which is the bronze laver, where we see the God's word purifies us. Uh, he cleanses us. He washes us. Um, right. And then after which that is uh, the outer court. And now we enter the inner courts. Right. Um, the, the, again, there was a curtain that separated us. They had to enter through the cu uh, curtain uh, from the outer court to the inner court. And as soon as you e you enter the inner court, or also known as the uh, holy place, okay, not the most holy place, but the, the holy place, you are introduced to your right. As you enter to your right, you find the table of showbread or shoe bread. Uh, we call this the place of satisfaction. Okay. This is the satisfaction. So the bread that was kept on the table was also called as the bread of the face. In other words, the bread uh, that was kept before the face or the presence of God. Uh, the throne room overall is also known as the room of the face. That means its face represented the presence. Uh, that, that's what the face was used there. When God, the Bible says that he spoke uh, with Moses face to face, that means he, the most intimate one is there in the room. And that's what it is. Okay, And why we call this a place of satisfaction? Uh, and you can read about it. Uh, actually, let's read about it in Exodus chapter 26, verse 30, 35, and 37. It's in the notes. Uh, it says, and you shall raise up the tabernacle according to its pattern, which you were shown on the mountain. You shall set the table outside the veil and the lampstand across the table uh, on the side of the tabernacle towards the south. And you shall put the table on the north side. You shall make a screen for the door of the tabernacle, woven of blue, purple, and scarlet thread, and fine woven linen. Again, you see those four colors. Uh, and made by, oh, weaver. And you shall make for the screen five pillars of acacia wood and overlay with gold their hooks shall be gold and you shall cast five sockets of bronze for them okay it's a table of showbread uh, and on this the, there would be 12 uh, loaves of bread that would uh, symbolize um, the 12 tribes of israel it's a place of satisfaction uh the bread and again john chapter 6 verse 35 we see jesus say that i am the bread of life he who comes to me shall never hunger and he who believes in me shall never thirst and same chapter in verse 51 it says i am the living bread which came down from heaven it's the place of satisfaction um it's, uh, so if anybody wants a reference i just uh it was John 6 33 right uh, that is for the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world uh, and verse 35 goes on to say that I am the bread of life okay uh, and it also represents communion breaking the bread so this is the uh, the table of showbread is the place of satisfaction and then opposite to the table of shoe bread is the golden lampstand. Um, we're calling this the place of illumination, or in other words, a place of revelation, right? A light. Uh, let's read the scripture. Now, okay, guys, I just want, uh, as a side note, we are not, all of these furnitures, uh, pieces of furniture can be looked and studied in detail. Uh, you know, but we are just kind of going through the overview of all of this. Um, you know, I feel like we don't need to go too deep into studying the each uh, pieces of furniture uh, in detail. Um, so just giving us an overview of all these. All right. So uh, let's read. I'm reading from your notes in Exodus 26, verse 30, 35, and 37. It goes on to say, and you shall raise up the tabernacle to its pattern, which you were shown on the bread. You shall set aside. Uh, it, same scripture that we read before, and the lamp stand across the table in the side of the table towards the south, and you shall put the table on the north side. You shall make a screen the front door woven with blue, purple, and scarlet thread, and with fine woven linen made by a weaver. Okay, uh, in Exodus 27, 20, 21, and you shall command the children of Israel that they bring pure oil 
of pressed olives for the light to cause the lamp to burn continually. Um, the lamp was never to go off. It was the responsibility and the duty of the priest to make sure that the lamp was always burning day and night. Um, no excuse. Are we calling this a place of uh, revelation or illumination? Uh, and what does uh, you know light brings? It helps us see, isn't it? It kind of opens our eyes to um, you know in the natural. Uh, see, God always uses the tangible to explain or teach us ab about the intangibles, right? He would always use the natural to teach us about the supernatural. Uh, right, so he's using the lampstand, in other words, uh, you know, to teach us something about the uh, the ultimate light of the world. Uh, right, that is John chapter eight, verse twelve. Uh, Jesus says, "I am the light of the world." Right, uh, whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. That means he will walk with the revelation. He will live his life. He will do everything that he has to do. He or she has to do with the revelation that I provide because he is in me and I am in him and I am the light of the world uh, right uh, are you with me okay so that um, so that place is the place of illumination uh, and as another scripture that I'd like to give us is John chapter 1 verse 4 and 5 John 1 verse 4 and 5 it says in him uh, was life and the life was the light of men and the light shines in darkness, and the darkness was not, uh, and darkness has not overcome it. Uh, so I, I, I don't know how far this is accurate. I'm not a medical student, but uh, the science say the blood is actually congealed light. Um, so I didn't, I haven't got the time to actually study on that statement, uh, but it says the blood is actually congealed light. Um, so. Um, it kind of makes sense when you see overall, you know, without blood you die. And then you read scriptures like this says, you know, uh, he is the light of the world. Uh, you know, in him was life and that life was the light of men. Uh, I'm like, yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I might not understand science, but I understand this. Uh, right. So the golden lamp stand. Uh, it, it was a beautiful piece of furniture. It was made up of one piece uh, layered with gold from from the branches. Uh, and it signified an almond branch, an, a, a branch of an almond tree. Right? I, I'm not sure if you remember the vision that Jeremiah has in the beginning of the book of Jeremiah. Uh, and God asks Jeremiah, what do you see? I see an almond tree, you know. I, the first time I read that, okay, so he sees an almond tree. What's the big deal about it? You know, he sees an almond tree, and then God goes on to say, I will do a new thing. And so in their culture, in their region, geographically, uh, after the winter, the first plant or the tree to spring forth uh, is the tree of the, is, is the almond tree. And so that symbolized uh, the season of new beginning. Um, right, and so uh, there's something about the almond tree and you know their culture and their region. Uh, so what, what God was telling Jeremiah is that I'm getting ready to do a new thing. That's what you're seeing, uh, and and the place uh, and this um, the place of revelation or illumination is is kind of showing us that you know what God is constantly doing in our lives. Um, right, guys, am I going fast? Uh, are you all with me? Um, let's move to the last piece of furniture um, in the inner courts. That is the golden altar of incense. Golden altar of incense. Uh, this is uh, the altar of uh, intercession. Right? Okay. So we'll read um, 
Actually, can someone read that Exodus chapter 30, verse 1 to 9, please, if you don't mind? Exodus 30, verse 1 to 9, if anybody can, because um, I've been reading quite a lot. Zero, right? So 30. You shall make an altar yes. to burn incense you shall... on. You shall make it of acacia wood. A cubit shall be its length and a cubit its width. It shall be a square and two cubits shall be its height. Its horn shall be of one piece with it. And you shall overlay its top, its sides all around, and its horns with pure gold. And you shall make for it a molding of gold all around. Two gold rings you shall make for it, under the molding on both its sides. You shall place them on its two sides, and they will be holders for the poles with which to bear it. You shall make the poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. And you shall put it before the veil that is before the ark of the testimony, before the mercy seat that is over the testimony, where I will meet with you. Aaron shall burn on it sweet incense every morning. When he tends the lamps, he shall burn incense on it. And when Aaron lights a lamp at twilight, he shall burn incense on it, a perpetual incense before the Lord throughout your generations. You shall not offer strange incense on it, or a burnt offering, or a grain, or a grain offering, nor shall you pour a drink offering on it, and Aaron shall make atonement upon his horns once a year with the blood of the sin offering of atonement. Once a year he shall make atonement upon it throughout your generations. It is most holy to the Lord. Thanks, John. Right. Um, so this is a place of intercession, uh, the altar of incense, right? In um, verse, you can continue reading about it in verse, uh, in the same chapter, Exodus thirty, verse thirty four and two thirty eight. Uh, you'll see that there were four. Uh, it was a mixture of four different ingredients, uh, uh, spices uh, that was used. And as when you enter the inner courts, uh, that there was no escape for the uh, for the smoke to go out, and so the inner courts would be filled with like you know. Um, you know, some of the Indian homes, uh, they put these uh, smoke, no? And <laughs> it would have been like that. Yeah, it's I, it's called something in Tamil. That, um, but yeah, uh, another kind of scripture that I was reminded about is Psalm 141, verse 2. It says, uh, let my prayer be counted as incense before you, right? And the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. My prayer be counted as incense that's why we call this as a place of intercession uh right and revelation we talk about the bowl of incense where the prayers of the saints was offered as in a bowl of incense uh right so uh, those are all imagery of intercession and we see that john uh, in john 17 verse 1 uh that whole chapter is jesus is praying in other words he's interceding uh for us in other words Right, uh, John chapter 17, verse 1 is he's saying, Father, the hour has come to glorify your son, that the son may glorify you. And then uh, he goes on to uh, make an epic prayer in that chapter. Uh, right, so this, the altar of incense was the altar of intercession. Uh, so the high priest would come, uh, he would intercede for the nation uh, of Israel on behalf. So intercession is simply means standing in the gap, right? Uh, you know, between you and the nation uh, i'm coming and standing in the gap interceding what uh, abraham does isn't it lord if you if i find at least 10 righteous people will you leave uh will, will you overlook this city if you look if you find at least one will you overlook this and not judge this people so what abraham was doing was interceding right it was an altar of intercession was very important it was a prayer altar of prayer that uh, symbolized prayer 
Okay, so there were three pieces of furniture. We're calling this a place of intercession. So in, in the inner courts or the holy place, there were three uh, pieces of uh, furniture. One is the table of showbread, uh, which is a place of satisfaction, uh, a, a golden lampstand, a table, uh, place of the illumination, and the go a golden altar of incense, which is uh, intercession. Right, and now, uh, and now again, there was a thick curtain that separated the holy place from the most holy place. Um, we enter into the holy of holies. Um, right now, here's the thing in the outer courts, you know. You can praise with a group of people, with with the crowd of people. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise. You know, there was a, it, the space was huge, uh, right? You could uh, whatever concert, you know, <laughs> like uh, hundreds of people uh, could praise. And and when you come into the inner courts, there's no enough space, but then there's still responsibilities that needs to be taken care of, right? So you can praise with a crowd of people. And the inner courts, you could you could serve with a team of people or group of people, 10, 13. But in the you can only worship him face to face. Right? You could praise him with a crowd of people in the outer courts. You can serve him, do ministry, you know, lead a church, everything, uh, with a group of people, with a team of people. But you could only worship him face to face. That it is in the holy of holies where we experience the psalm 46 verse 10 be still and know that i am god in the outer courts there was the natural sunlight uh, and in the inner courts uh, there was the light from the golden lampstand but in the holy of holies there was divine light which was the light of the glory of god uh, and and when we started this journey of studying about the tabernacle we started from the gate way out in the gates and then the outer courts and the inner courts and then finally the holy of holies but when god tells moses to build the tabernacle he starts in exodus 25 he starts from the inside from the ark of the covenant and then goes outside that is the progression which is followed when you read when you, you know you uh, you know it when you read it from exodus 25 he starts come uh, gives the commandment on how to build the ark of the covenant and so another way to look at it is that he's always bothered about the inside right? he's always looking on the inside that's what matters to him right what you do on the outside with the crowd of people with the team of people all the all that's great it's appreciated it's commended but right? finally comes down to that one-on-one -on -one conversation with him. And that is the Holy of Holies. Uh, it, it, and once a year, the, whole, uh, the high priest would go in and pour the blood uh, on the mercy seat. Uh, it was an atonement for the nation of Israel. Right? And we call this um, the Holy of Holies or the most holy place. There's a bunch of scriptures that is mentioned in the notes. You can go through it all. Um, yeah, uh, so that is the tabernacle of Moses. Uh, it's We see, again, see the order in it. Uh, you know, nobody came in doing whatever they felt like doing <laughs> uh, or dressed up as any way they wanted to. Uh, God was very specific in his detail, uh, right, about how this tabernacle had to be built, what needs to be done. Uh, and, you know, later when you study more deeper, uh, we know that the tribe of Levites were the priestly tribes. But the tribe of Levites had three different clans, right? Levite has three different sons. And you'll read about it in the book of Numbers. Uh, and each of those clans had a different responsibility. And the clan, the Kohathites that this Aaron is from, only they were responsible of carrying the Ark of the Covenant. So all the Levites were priests, but not, uh, you know, but not, excuse me, I want to say all priests were Levites, 
but not all Levites, uh, you know, were high priests. So they had to come from a particular clan called the Kohats, Kohathites. And every time you read about this in the Old Testament, uh, where the people were carrying the Ark of the Covenant in specifically, it mentions that the Kohathites were carrying the Ark of the Covenant. So Kohath, the Kohath was one of the sons of the Levi. Okay, so uh, it, it gets very interesting when you want to go deeper and want to study about the Tabernacle of Moses. Uh, it's just a wonderful, wonderful, um, you know, I encourage every Christian uh, to study about it, just to learn because uh, of, you know, things that it has to teach us. All right, any questions so far, guys? You know, I've been going on and on for a while, so. <laughs> Any thoughts that you want to share or anything that's one thing that stood out from what you've learned today? Okay, that's fine. So, uh, you know, we'll conclude with this one thought I just wanted to share is, uh, you know, when Jesus died uh, on the cross, we see that the mountains trembled and the earthquake happened and the curtain in the temple was torn, right? And it also very specifically says it was torn from top to bottom, not from bottom to top. If it mentioned that, it, it, it would entail that someone, a man tore it from down, you know, but it was torn from top to bottom. And that means now that the veil is torn, you read about it more in the book of Hebrews, the veil is torn. And then, uh, you know, it signifies John chapter 1, verse 14, uh, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That means he came from his throne, from the Holy of Holies, that he came into our place and he broke the bread of communion, the table of show. But that means he came to fellowship with his people and he dwelt. Uh, so, the Ark of the uh, the study of the Tabernacle of Moses is um, so much more deeper than just to study about worship. All right, so that's about it for today's session. Uh, nice office, Paul. <laughs> right. Okay. So if there's no thoughts or any questions, uh, we can pause, stop here and resume next week. All right. Great. Thank you for joining. God bless you. Take care. Have a good one.